Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here, and especially in such a, a beautiful setting. Now, what I want to do today is sketch a way to deal with democratic representation by institutions, groups, and individuals in transnational politics. As I say it, it sounds impossible, and it probably is. Which is why I'm just presenting you with a sketch. This is quite deliberately an outline of something. It is not a fully completed, thought out argument. So I'm going to experiment on you, and I'm going to do that in a fairly open-ended way, and I'm going to introduce some new ideas and some new concepts along the way. And I look forward to hearing what you make of them. Now, I'm not going to try and make my sketch fit into a theory of global democracy. Now, presumably, a theory of democracy, whether it's global or at, at any other extent, requires certain things at a minimum. It would need an account of constitutional rights. It would need a conception of citizenship. It would need an account of justification, why democracy is a good thing, and an account of institutions that follow from that justification. So here I'm only going to deal with one quite specific possible component of such a model, and a relatively small one. Difficult one, but a relatively small one. And that's going to be assessing political representation, especially transnationally. So I offer you, I hope, a path for working with particularity, of working with complexity, following my impulse, and I have to confess freely my impulse, to be very careful about the reach and about the scope of the argument. So this cautious impulse stems from my preference for what I'm going to call slow theory. Uh, the issue of speed with the motorbike joke has already been introduced as well, so it's all there on the table. Speed and time, slowness, fast, speed and time, play a very particular role in the arguments about democratic legitimacy that I want to outline. And I'll get to that particularity in a moment. But before I do, I just want to make a couple of general comments about slow and fast theory, because these are very unfamiliar ideas, and they're ones that I'm beginning to try and work through myself. Slow food you may have heard of, slow cities, slow food, especially in Italian movement, well, slow cities also. Transition towns is a version of slow cities, maybe bubbling up in Finland, it certainly is in the UK uh, and elsewhere. Like advocates of slow food and slow cities, sometimes I use the term slow literally and at other times I use it metaphorically, it depends. So here goes, fairly bluntly, fast theory is comfortable about making and recommending more or less instant and complete answers to complex problems. It reminds me, and some of you may be familiar with some of this work, of the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk's idea of instant democracy. In one form, uh, in the form of the pneumatic parliament, a kind of global instant object that can be dropped from a plane and self-inflate. He meant it as a joke, uh, but it's an interesting and provocative joke. But a willingness to build a model of specific, encompassing institutions for global democracy, as, for example, David Herald arguably does, is also, I think, an example of fast theory, in a way. So fast theory, to be blunt, delivers fairly quickly a complete artifact or a result, such as a model of democracy. It's comparatively unbothered by complicating factors and is relentlessly oriented towards outcomes, achieving a single best outcome. Fast theory is often built around a small set of core normative assumptions or a small set of core concepts. And it often assumes that there is a single best answer to any political dilemma if only we're clever enough to find the path to find the answer. Slow theory, on the other hand, seeks to immerse itself, in a sense to bury itself in the complexity of the objects it is concerned about. For example, in claims and disputes about transnational democratic potential. It sees models of democracy as emerging from practices and new ideas of democracy as a kind of co-production over time between practitioners, activists and theorists. So fast and slow theory, clearly enough, are relational notions. They're not meant to be a black and white sense 
two types of contrasting work. There can be many examples and many instances and many degrees of both, and they are located on a spectrum or a continuum of possibilities. Now, you will have gathered already there are many difficult issues in putting forward these categories, thinking about the relationship between them, and thinking about examples from political theory or elsewhere that might fit these notions. I would argue that there is, there is an inevitable, strong, thick particularity which haunts theorizing on global democracy. I'm thinking especially of the local contested significance of the objects of the theorizing, individual and group identities, issues, debates, competing bodies of expertise and evidence, cultural and linguistic frames of reference, for example. And the politics of simplifying all of that, of systematizing it, is one that I think we need to put on the table. It's one of the reasons I raise these concepts. Now, I think there are several reasons to be skeptical about what I've called fast theory. First, there is no settled unit or community for democracy in transnational spaces. That is, there is no clear geographical or functional gap to be filled. Uh, you'll know more about this from the other day because Sophia Nastrum has spoken about the people in transnational politics. Secondly, invocations of democracy in this context ride on the back of other concerns about issues, problems, actors, and so on. And generalizing about democratic potential should be treated, I think, with great care. Democratic designs are always situated designs, even if they show promise of transfer later or adaptation later. And thirdly, whatever political theorists or anyone else for that matter in the academy might say, whatever they might do, practitioners and activists will do most of the designing of our future democratic practices, whether they know they're doing that designing or whether they don't. Again, democratic designs are in significant ways co-productions. So let me move on. Why transnational? Why this term transnational? Um, I use the word transnational rather than global or international, for example, because for me it captures the fuller range of interactions between individuals, groups, and institutions when we're talking about what's happening in more than one nation state. So against all of that background, fast, slow, transnational, caution, and all the rest of it, let me move on more directly to the key issues of transnational democratic representation. So this will involve, and this is kind of a, a sweep of the, the rest of the talk really, it will involve first of all defending the idea of the representative claim, the title of the book for which the advertisement has been made. It's at a very reasonable price from Oxford University Press and is available from all good bookshops. I say it's at a reasonable price, but like all publishers these days, Oxford University Press does a hardback book and charges a less than modest amount of money for it. Uh, and by some mysterious criteria or process, may decide later on to do a reasonably priced paperback. Uh, we'll wait and see. Uh, anyway, first, defending the idea of the representative claim. I'm going to be saying something about the core of this idea and why I think it's relevant to this topic. And secondly, I want to deal with the assessment, the democratic assessment of representative claims in transnational spaces, a very particular set of spaces and difficult set of spaces in which to think about representation, in which to think about democracy. And I'll finish, if I have time, with some comments on how my approach differs from one or two others on global democracy and on transnational representation. So let me turn to the idea of the representative claim. So the idea of the representative claim is at the heart. It's the kind of foundation of what I, what I want to be saying here. Now a representative claim is a claim that a person or group speaks for, stands for, or otherwise represents the interests of another person or group. It can be a claim made by a person, or it can be made by a group, or it can be made about them. Now, in, in its modern history, political representation has primarily been understood as a formal relationship between one who represents and one who is represented. 
In the contemporary era, of course, it's been understood mostly as a relationship where one person represents a geographical constituency in a legislature because they are duly elected. That is our conventional core contemporary understanding. So in a sense, in that contemporary vein, representation is a fact. It is a state of affairs. It is something that exists in the world relatively uncontroversially if somebody is duly elected in a free and fair election to a legislative seat or to a local council seat or an equivalent uh, position. However, when we think of representation as a claim, when we shift, as it were, from thinking of it as a settled fact following a certain practice, to a claim. Our attention shifts, I think, to the dynamics of that relationship. Who is claiming to speak for whom? On what basis are they claiming to speak for somebody else or something else? With what degree of success and publicity are they claiming to speak for somebody else? What representations in the aesthetic or the artistic sense do they construct in order to offer convincing claims? What resources do they use to back up these claims? Election, for example, may be one very powerful resource. If you all elected me to be the lecturer this morning, then the fact of that election would be a powerful resource for me standing here and saying, thank you, I represent you for these purposes, here and now. But unelected actors, I want to argue, also make resonant, often salient claims to represent in various contexts. Elective representation does not exhaust democratic representation, and that is one core thread running through what I want to say. Now, if you look in the dictionary, dictionaries define representation often as, in a more abstract sense, making present something that is absent. Tricky, interesting philosophical idea that's kept me awake at night more than once. Okay. Making present something that is absent. Hang on, it's both present and absent. In what sense present and absent? But in politics, I want to suggest to you, representation more accurately means giving the impression of making something present, giving the impression of making something present. And a political figure who attempts this impression, or an observer who points to such an impression, is making a representative claim. Now, when the claim is more formally defined, the representative claim consists of five elements, uh, and I hope you forgive me for no PowerPoint today. It would seem a shame to denigrate this lovely lecture theatre with a PowerPoint, uh, but, but you do have a double-sided handout, and if you don't, there are some more copies here. And in one of the boxes on that handout is uh, a quick snapshot of the formal definition of a representative claim. And what it says there, there are five key components. I'm not going to dwell on them, I'm just going to say them. Uh, a maker of representations, puts forward a subject which stands for an object which depicts a referent to an audience. These are the five key components. So the representative claim is a claim. It may or may not be a well-judged claim. It may or may not be an accepted claim. It may or may not be a well-founded claim. That question remains very much open. So let me offer you a conventional example to try and illustrate uh, some of these components of the representative claim. A member of parliament as a maker, for example, offers herself as a subject as the embodiment of constituency interests. I know you, I know who you are, I know the way you think, I know your interests, I hear your opinions, I can speak for you, I'm one of you. And in saying something like that, I'm painting a picture of you, like an artist or like a sculptor. I'm putting back to you an image of yourselves that I want you to buy, I want you to accept, because I want to be able to speak for you. So there is this dynamic two-way process occurring as a part of claim making. So I claim to be the embodiment of your interests, that's the object, to the constituency, which is part of the audience. I'll come back to audience in a little bit. Now the referent is the is you, is the actual flesh and blood people of the constituency. Okay, some of this comes out of Saussurean linguistics and other bits that I won't, go, I won't go into. So the object involves a selective portrayal or a painting 
of the constituency, which is, as I suggest, like an artistic portrait. Now, looking at representation through the lens of the representative claim has certain effects. Well, it has certain effects on me. Uh, it made me write a book. Um, it tends, I think, to historicize representation. It tends also to contextualize representation. It complicates ideas that representation has been achieved. We're, we're accustomed, I think, normally in politics, thinking representation exists. This person is a representative. This party represents. And there's something fairly uncontroversial about that. But I think seeing it as a claim, as a process of claim making, complicates the idea of its very achievement. We get directed not so much to its presence, but to the allegation that it is present. And what is holding up and indeed disputing or contesting that allegation. So the claim-based approach also emphasizes, as I've suggested, the dynamic and the constitutive character of political representation, whether it's democratic representation or whether it's not. And it sets up a challenge, I think, to conventional analysis of representation in terms of roles. Now, if you look at the literature, as many of you probably have, and some of you here are experts in it, um, a lot of the literature, especially the American-based political science literature on representation, talks about roles. Some of this goes back to Burke. You know, there are trustees, there are delegates, there are politicos, spokespersons, advocates, champions. I mean, then there are various, various, other, various other terms. So, you know, which role is being played? What representative role is being occupied? But I think looking at representation through the lens of the claim challenges fairly fundamentally analyzing representation in terms of roles. Potential representatives or would-be representatives don't choose, I suggest, don't choose between delegate, trustee, politico, principal agent, etc. roles. Rather, they make claims to be delegates. They make claims to be spokespersons. They make claims to be champions, advocates, and so on. They can play, or they can claim, or they can perform different roles at the same time. And when I say perform, I do mean in the theatrical sense, different roles at the same time. They can switch between roles. They can blend roles. That's where leaders like Clinton and Blair and others have often, I'm not saying I agree with this, but often been commended for their political skills, whatever you think of the ideological politics that may, may have pursued, in terms of being able to occupy, act, in the sense of acting on the stage, acting out combinations of roles, performing different roles to different constituencies and audiences, sometimes at the same time. So in other words, these supposed roles are in fact, I think in many ways, resources, not roles. They are resources for representative claims. They are ways in which one can act and one can claim in order to back up this supposed status of being a representative. Now, the representative claim approach carries implications for how representation might best be studied. It slows down, it contextualizes normative impulses in particular. Now, I think these characteristics of the claim-based approach to representation are helpful when we're investigating democratic practice in the difficult terrain of transnational politics, where election and formal office are more diffuse or perhaps more importantly, it is less frequently evident or available. So I want to move on now to look at transnational representative claim making. And here I have to refer you to the handout again. I did try this once on PowerPoint, but it's so complex. It's the, um, the figure, the figure domains of representation, which I think just appears on one side. Uh, of the handout. When I tried it as a PowerPoint, uh, nobody could read it, everybody squinted, and it was all very difficult. Now, in this figure, I depict three nested levels of representation. Representative democracy, the familiar institutions of state, elections, parliament, and so on that we are familiar with, representative democracy is conceived as positioned within a field defined by a broader domain, democratic representation. And these two domains, in their turn, are located within a yet wider field of political representation. You see the point of the concentric circles. 
and the, defining the different domains there. Now the main point here, the main point of the diagram is to illustrate the point that democratic representation as a dynamic practice of claim making is not limited to the familiar, though still important, institutions of representative democracy in the nation state. It includes those institutions, democratic representation includes the institutions of representative democracy, but it also consists of a wider, more diffuse, a more unsettled set of practices and institutions. Representative democracy as a centralized state system is both continuous with and it is changed by, influenced by developments in these wider domains. Some of these institutions and some of these practices might reasonably be labeled democratic and some may not. So democratic representation ought to be understood, I'm arguing, as a quality more or less present in a wider set of diffuse locations and practices, less commented on and less visible than we are normally used to doing when we talk of representative democracy more narrowly. I would argue that representative democracy can only be recommended normatively or selected as a focus analytically in our work from within, from within a wider field or a wider domain which is defined by this wider canvas of societal democratic representation. Now the figure includes four nodes of variation. Uh, you see these numbered one to four across the three nested domains. I realize it's not very helpful on film, is it? But hopefully the description will help. We might be able to kind of funnel something in um, at the appropriate point, uh, the visual representation. So the figure includes four nodes of variation across these three domains, across these three domains. These are not the only four, but they are, I think, four key ones. So these four nodes suggest difference and continuity between the different domains and the four nodes are institutional presence, exit and voice, legitimate authority and how it's generated, and conceptions of territory. So the figure is meant to suggest, and these four nodes are meant to suggest, that we need to look at the variations and also the relationships and the points of commonality, indeed, between the three nested domains for each of these four areas. So, for example, in the figure, node one, institutional presence, the wider domain of democratic representation is normally understood to involve temporary and shifting modes of representation, while the narrower statal domain involves the more permanent presence of representative state institutions. Now, there's a lot more I should say about that. Um, hey, it's in the book. Um, did I say it's very written? No, I did. So there's a, good, there's a lot more I should really say to unpack uh, and certainly to defend you know, some of these notions. But I want to focus straight away on the characteristics of institutions and practices located at the outer reaches of democratic representation. That's where I want to begin to focus attention a little more. It's here that we can find representation that is reasonably described as democratic but is not generally part of the familiar institutions of representative democracy. And this helps, I think, also to focus on transnational democratic representation. Now, the institutions of representative democracy are rare, arguably, at a transnational level, with the significant and partial exception of the European Union. So as a result, we need to be attentive to unfamiliar forms of representative claim and unfamiliar forms of reception of representative claims. Now, I make no assumptions here about how much transnational democratic representation is out there. No assumptions at all. How we might approach that question is precisely the point of the talk. And nor do I focus on any one type of transnational actor or style of action. Uh, governmental, intergovernmental bodies, NGOs, IGOs, INGOs, corporations, individuals operating autonomously or operating through networks all of these I include here in principle. So more specifically, how ought we to characterize representative practices in these wider domains of democratic representation, especially transnational politics? How would we characterize representative practice there? 
So as some of the terms in that figure in front of you suggest, these representative practices are likely to be characterized in comparative terms by certain features, uh, which I'm going to go through quite quickly now. First of all, these practices are likely to be variable in terms of their institutional presence. The form representative claims take will vary widely. Their longevity and the extent to which they're linked to persisting institutions, such as UN institutions, will also vary widely. Secondly, the operation of multiple modes of exit and voice. This means the extent to which those invoked in a representative claim are able to express their dissent or agreement will vary widely as well. For example, people implicated by Bono, Bono of U2's now famous claim to represent a lot of people in Africa, may or may not have had a chance to assent or agree or dissent or ignore or dispute or whatever that particular claim. This is a, a quote and a claim that's become quite famous in recent debates, as you may know, on uh, the theory of representation, where Bono, just offhand as a part of an interview with a UK newspaper, said, uh, well, actually, I represent a lot of people in Africa. You know, Band-Aid and all that. I represent a lot of people in Africa. Um, they didn't ask me, uh, so it's a bit cheeky, but I hope they're glad that I do. And this, this throwaway line has been analysed to death um, and has been the, the, root of, the root of entire new theories, so we should thank Bono, uh, you, know, you know, for the Joshua Tree. That was a pretty good album. I think it's slumped a bit since, but, you know, for the quote has been very useful. Okay. Characterized also, okay, representative practices again, in these wider domains of democratic representation. Characterized also by variable degrees, styles, and claims with regard to authority. Now, representative claimants at the World Bank, for example, may be able to claim some formal authority from their support from national governments. Others may claim a kind of informal authority. Subcommandante Marcos of the Zapatista Army, for example, may be able to claim some degree of moral authority in terms of international representative claims. Some claimants will claim to be in authority. Others will claim to be an authority. Others, again, will blend these roles. Actually, Marcos is really interesting. We might be able to come back to that later. He makes what I would call an anti-representative claim, which is a very clever way of making a representative claim, but that's another story. Moving on, we're looking here at characteristics of claim making in these wider reaches of democratic representation, including transnational politics. A variability in the extent to which representative claims invoke territory. Now, transnational claims to represent indigenous rights for example, may invoke the issue of cultural oppression on the one hand, or they may invoke rights to control or to sovereignty with regard to specific pieces of territory, specific geographical locations. Now those points about authority, exit and voice and so on, they arise primarily from the figure. And I would just add a couple more uh, as well. So to those points, I want to add that representative claims and practices in this wider domain of democratic representation, are also likely to display, I think, a great fluidity in number, frequency, and visibility from one month and from one year to the next. So, for example, claims to represent Islam and the interests of a Muslim community across as well as within nation states have been prominent, as we know, in recent years. Now, a few decades ago, such claims would have been different in character and different in prominence. But in the 1950s, for, for example, claims on transnational stages to represent the interests of workers across many countries would have had more prominence, arguably, and more salience, uh, perhaps, than today. In this wider domain also, claims are also likely to make distinctive use of types of representation as resources. I was hinting at this a moment ago the use of resources to back up their claims. So, for example, the head of a corporate citizenship arm of a major international oil company or the executive director of a human rights organization cannot easily, cannot openly, cannot rhetorically 
make a claim to be, quote unquote, a representative, because that term is generally speaking too closely tied to formal election. So this is the main reason why other terms are so often used, stakeholders, champions, spokespersons, advocates, and others. Further, these claims, claims in these transnational spaces of democratic representation especially, are likely to display a clearer tendency to be constitutive of the constituencies they aim to represent. Pierre Bourdieu was particularly strong on this. In a sense, you cannot have a group to be represented unless there is a claim to represent them. In a sense, the representative creates the group that they claim to speak for. Certainly, at least, they create the particular character, the particular portrait that they wish to speak for, going back to some earlier comments I made. And this is what I refer to, the process of being constitutive of identity, of character, of other aspects, of, as it were, the silent constituency. Sometimes constituencies, of course, are not silent, um, but all too often they are rendered silent by the making of a representative claim. So elected members of national parliaments can claim, for example, that their constituencies are straightforward, folks, formal, they are given, they are preformed. So, of course, they're not these things in all sorts of ways. But the relatively open-ended, informal, and potential character of constituencies for especially non-elective representative claims in transnational contexts means that those constituencies are more fully brought into being, more fully created, constituted, through the vehicle of the claim itself, constituted and created through the process of claims in this sense, to some extent. A claim to speak for is also a claim to speak about. But some claims are more fully constitutive than others. And finally, claims in this wider context are, I think, less anchored in formal modes of accountability to a constituency. Uh, recent accounts add, for example, the potential of financial accountability, moral, professional, and other modes of accountability to electoral or hierarchical accountability. So, beyond representative democracy in nation states, we enter a dynamic and changeable, unsettled domain of representative claim making. Some claims in this wider domain can make a reasonable case to be examples of democratic representation. And so I want to turn now to the question of how that claim can be supported, how we might make assessments from a democratic point of view of some of these claims. Now there are some prominent commentators on these sorts of issues who don't think there's an issue, really, in thinking about the democratic character and potential of actors in what some people call global civil society. Now, Castells, for example, with regard to NGOs, is you know, pretty relaxed about their democratic character. He takes it, my words rather than his, almost for granted. My basic position is that we need, for any given example or case, to do a lot of interpretive work to assess the democratic character of transnational representative claims. And the principle of these assessments is printed on your handout with a typo, a deliberate typo. We can discuss it later. And this is put in rather Rawlsian language with words that are chosen carefully apart from typographical errors. Indeed, it makes the error rather less forgivable than it might otherwise be. Okay. But it goes like this. I think provisionally acceptable claims to democratic legitimacy are those for which there is evidence of sufficient acceptance by someone called an appropriate constituency under certain conditions of judgment. What this really boils down to, and what I'm claiming, is that yes, we can figure out if some of these, in this complex outer domain of potential democratic representation, especially in transnational spaces, we need to ask ourselves, do the people who are being invoked by the claim, does the potential constituency of the claim accept this claim or not? How can we tell if they accept this claim or not? If they do, then we need to take that as provisional acceptance because we're operating in a dynamic 
and changeable context. And we need to ask under what conditions, with what degree, for example, of personal autonomy, whatever that means exactly, did people make these judgments? Did they even have the chance to hear the claims about them? Did they get a chance to dispute them? How many of them did? Do you see my points? So the key point in all this is that it is the members of the potential constituency themselves, not a normative political theorist coming along and applying, as it were, over the top of all of this, some sort of global normative theory, but the invoked potential members of those constituencies themselves who get to say whether this is an acceptable, and in my terms here, provisionally a democratic claim. So claims can be democratic for the time being, provisionally, if accepted by constituents. Now, there are various elements to this. I won't try and justify each of them, but just to, to go through them quickly. Judgments of legitimacy are made by the people subject to the claim. Again, not by theorists, not by other external observers. It is the actual, actual acceptance, not the hypothetical acceptance or rejection of claims, which is relevant in this context. Representative claims, again, can only at best be regarded provisionally as acceptable or democratic. The conditions under which the judgments are made matter, matter hugely. Were people effectively coerced into accepting a certain representative claim? Could they have chosen otherwise in the circumstances? Independent observers have a role in evaluating these sorts of conditions, which arguably center around core notions to do with the open society. Now, that's a very big topic, which I forgive the repetition, don't want to um, open up here, so, but it's, I think we need to revisit the open society there. I'll just kind of put that on the table and we can talk about it after uh, if we want. Now, each of these points is fairly controversial. That is, each of the components of what I'm suggesting is the principal way we can assess, or we can see as assessed, transnational representative claims is quite controversial. I can't say more about them uh, here because time is already moving on. But instead, I want to focus on two linked issues. The definition of the group who can rightfully make judgments of democratic representation. You know, this amorphous, tricky, shifting constituency that gets to make these judgments. Who are they? How do we know who the constituency is? Because we're not talking about geographical electoral districts here in a conventional representative democracy sense. So who's the group that can rightfully make judgments? And secondly, come back to the issue of time, slowness, speed, fast, in the making and the interpreting of these assessments. Now, the group that may rightfully, I suggest, make legitimacy judgments, I refer to as the appropriate constituency. And this is the final component on the uh, handout. Uh, on the first page, you will see a table that links, well, it comes under the heading constituency and audience. So the group that can rightfully make these judgments, I'm suggesting that we refer to as the appropriate constituency. In fluid and dynamic transnational politics, we do not have conventional electoral constituencies to fall back on. So the job is harder. So this makes the issue of constituency really problematic. I suggest, though, that the way through these difficulties, potentially, is to regard the appropriate constituency as a combination of an intended and an actual constituency. And this is what the, the little diagram or boxes are getting at in the handout. So there is, I suggest, often an identifiable appropriate constituency in this difficult and shifting domain of the wider reaches of political representation. And the appropriate constituency consists of an intended constituency and an actual constituency. The intended constituency is the group that the claimant claims to speak for. So if I claim to speak for everybody in the second row, you are my intended constituency. I don't intend the rest of you to be in part of my constituency. I'm just speaking for these four people. Okay. You are my intended constituency. The actual constituency, on the other hand, is the group whose members recognize their interests as being implicated in the claim in some way. So the rest of you in the room might think, oh, he thinks he's just talking for them, or about them, or both. But actually, I'm kind of part of this audience too. And if he's making a claim about them, he's kind of making a claim about me. I'm part of the actual audience of this process of you know, representative claiming that's going on here. 
So intended constituency and actual constituency. So made up of the intended plus the actual constituency, the appropriate constituency, in other words, consists of those people who are spoken to and spoken about by a claimant, plus those who recognize their interest as being invoked, or being raised in a sense, being introduced in the claim. The membership of these two groups may be distinct in various ways, may be utterly distinct, in other words, there's no overlap in the membership between the intended and the actual, or they might coincide perfectly, or any of the points in between. There are some lovely diagrams on page something or other of the book which express some of the possibilities there. Now, I refer to the appropriate constituency because that is the constituency whose judgments of democratic legitimacy of claims should ultimately count. However, constituencies are not the only members of the effective group whose assessments do sometimes count in practical terms. Audiences, so the audience is a separate thing, again, sometimes overlapping with constituency, but audiences, including, for example, the media or various parts of the media, who are not part of a claim's constituency in any sense, may also influence the assessment of representative claims. I don't have time to go into this, but of course claims are all mediated, and many of them are mediated by newspapers, by web, by editors, okay? This is not an innocent process of me making a claim and you receiving it. Somewhere in that process is a series of filtering, mediation, reinterpretation, representation, and so on. So audiences can also have an impact on the success or failure of representative claims. Now, how are we doing? I'm not sure what time we started, so... It... You still have about 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Okay, well, I won't, okay? I won't go to 20, but I'll... Uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Now, again, a lot more should be said to justify that, but we'll have a... You know, Johanna is going to make his comments, and we'll have um, perhaps a, a little time uh, to talk. But I want to turn now briefly, if I can, really quite briefly, to a second key aspect of this approach. The question of making these assessments over time. So I've suggested in that principle that's on the, the handout there, that it takes time for the appropriate constituency to make these judgments. And the observer, the political theorist, the political scientist needs to allow time for evidence of acceptance or evidence of rejection of representative claims to emerge. And this takes me back, in a more focused way, to the idea of slow theory. Now, observing the dynamics of a representative claim like Oxfam's, for example, or by an indigenous people's advocacy group like Survival International, <coughs> takes time. Interpretation of who may make up the intended constituencies, and especially the actual constituencies, of such claims won't be easy and can only be done effectively, if at all, over time. More crucially, listening to the voices or watching for signs of a claim's acceptance will be challenging and will also take time. Politics is, and certainly can be, a messy, slow and uneven business. The political theorist approaching these assessments will need to do slow theory to see the normative content of their projects as provisional, as cumulative, as co-produced, perhaps haphazardly, rather than as potentially complete, fully justified, or accurately and wholly captured by their models and concepts. Now, observers of specific sets of claims will need to allow time, for example, for the ingredients that enable assessment to become fully manifest, or at least sufficiently manifest. This will involve, importantly, denying an immediate stipulative assumption of illegitimacy of representative claims. I mean, in the literature, for example, it is often said, um, if it's an informal, this formal-informal distinction, there is formal representation, there is informal representation, Formal representation is when you are duly elected. Informal representation is all the other stuff, 
formal is democratic, informal is undemocratic. Well, maybe they're not, but that's where we start. That's the stipulative assumption we start with. I'm suggesting to you we reject that stipulative assumption at the so-called informal, which I don't think is a helpful term, but certainly non-elective or transnational or unfamiliar or unconventional. We ought not start with the stipulative assumption that these are illegitimate, that these are democratically illegitimate, or that they are undemocratic. So what I'm describing here in a way is political theory, perhaps political science more broadly, as methodical patient detective work. The observer will need the fruits of detailed interpretive work to find out if the acceptance of claims or a reasonable process of non-objection is evident in a given case. We can't know if a representative claim has been accepted unless we are prepared to explore the meanings of that claim for the citizens who are subject to it or invoked by it or addressed by it. It follows also that notions of provisional acceptability, which I've stressed already, are important. That point becomes even stronger the more we stress the importance of the constituency standpoint. It's the people themselves who get to make these assessments. So a tricky question, of course, one amongst many here, is how long is long enough? How long is long enough to know if a given claim has earned a degree of democratic legitimacy? There can be no single answer. I'm sorry, I told you I was going to be cautious. The best broad answer is long enough for most, if not all, of the members of the appropriate constituency to have registered objections to it in a context which enables those objections to be raised at no significant cost to the different actors concerned. Now, all of that is to say that sometimes, perhaps more often than is commonly realized or accepted, the tasks of political theory require immersion in the context of material political worlds and the frames through which participants interpret those worlds. Sometimes, in other words, political theory needs to be slow theory. Now, theory can be slow in different ways. Um, I would emphasize three ways in particular. Theory can be done slowly. It can recommend slowness. I can recommend a slow politics, whatever that may be exactly. And thirdly, it might make explicit its own arguments about speed. And I think what I've said today, I refer in a way to each of these different senses, perhaps the first two in particular. Now, given the shortage of time, I was going to go into those a little more because this is my current hobby horse. Um, uh, these terms are very unfamiliar. Um, I'm trying to work through what slow theory may mean, working with a man, uh, Jeff Andrews, a colleague of mine at the Open University, who you may have come across, the author of a very, very good book called The Slow Food Story. Second book recommendation. I get no royalties out of this one. The Slow Food Story by Jeff Andrews, published by Pluto in paperback. Uh, and we're working up a research project around some of, these, uh, some of these ideas, but I won't go into them further there because we're running short of time. Now, I've suggested that in the fluidity and the variability of transnational politics, representative claims may be made by and they may be made about a great variety of actors. Some of these claims may involve democratic representation, some may not. Resisting the attractions, and believe me, they are real attractions, I know that, of what I have called fast theory, I've suggested a detailed interpretive way to assess the extent to which appropriate constituencies of representative claims accept those claims or not. And I've emphasized that doing slow theory means keeping a sense of provisionality over time for the outcomes of those assessments. Now, the position I take here differs quite a bit from some other key writers, and I've been very selective here, uh, in debates about global democracy and in debates about transnational democratic representation. So uh, as I move towards conclusion, I want to make a couple of brief comments there to help me clarify and to defend, up to a point, my approach, uh, with very brief reference to the work of people like Held, Dreisach and Niemeyer, Dario Castiglione, Mark Warren, James Bowman, and perhaps one or two others. So I want to just note, I was going to describe some of that work, but you will know some of that work, and again, time is short. 
So I'm going to note what I take to be some important points of distinction between the work of Held, the work of Dreisach and Niemeyer on representation and some others um, as a way of trying to clarify some of the points that I've made. Now for David Held, with the cosmopolitan model of democracy, and for John Dreisach and Simon Niemeyer, perhaps I'm leaping ahead too far, are these unfamiliar notions, are they reasonably... Shall I step back a little bit? I will step back just a little bit. David Held, who I think probably the most cited author in all of this in many ways, uh, his cosmopolitan model of democracy envisages transnational representation as occurring in layered or nested levels of formal representative institutions from the global to the local. Think federalism on a global level, and you've got the core of Held's model. For Dreisach and Niemeyer, and I'm thinking of a piece they wrote in 2008 in particular, representing discourses, the key word here, representing discourses, is a more promising route to democratizing transnational space. So these are different general approaches to transnational or global democracy. They say, Dreisack and company, discursive representation, interesting idea, is especially appropriate where a well-bounded demos is hard to locate. Okay? And they recognize that discourses can evolve with time and so on, but representing discourses operating in transnational space is for them more important than representation of the number of people in a given discourse. Okay, so this is, and they're quite critical of David Held's approach. It's not about having a global parliament and global federalism. It's about representing discourses. Don't worry about the numbers of people who believe in them. There are environmental discourses, neoliberal discourses, social democratic discourses, and a range of others. And it's the discourses that count. And they even talk about a chamber of discourses, like a parliament, you know, a kind of bold design uh, for representing these. Uh, I refer also to the work of Dario Castiglione and Mark Warren in a piece of writing last year, where they note the inadequacy of models of representation in what they call the new ecology of democratic representation, especially non-territorial, transnational, and non-electoral representative claims. They also note that, and I quote, we need ways of judging the democratic credentials of representative claims. Absolutely, quite right. Focusing on this aspect of their work, they stress the importance of accountability. So they ask, I'm, I'm talking about them because they ask the same questions I'm asking, but their answer is accountability. In fact, they automatically assume the answer is something to do with accountability. And that's where I want to pick up in a moment. Now, James Bowman, final one I'll mention, seeks to, and I use his words, to redefine democracy so as to make it appropriate to transnational settings. He has a book and a few articles on this published. So he seeks to define what he calls a new democratic minimum, which enables a description of a new form of transnational democratic order based around the idea of demoi rather than a demos uh, to be put forward. So this is a fairly traditional take on democratic theorizing, creating the ideal feasible model, and then after seeking out its institutional counterpart but with a new transnational twist. Now, I've been deeply unfair to the work of some colleagues there by being so brief, uh, but nevertheless, let me try and distinguish myself from just one or two aspects of this. This is very selective. Now, for Held, and in a different sense for Dreisach and Niemeyer, the institutional form that transnational representation might take, global parliaments, global chambers of discourse, is a priority. This form, the institutional form, is a priority. From my perspective, to give it this priority is to go too far too soon. The myriad practices of democratic representation in transnational spaces and the uses of a wide array of institutions are, for me, more significant. Secondly, the focus on formality in Bowman's and in Held's work, for example, often runs together with a continuing restrictive focus, I think, on the narrower domain of representative democracy style institutions. In other words, some of this theorizing about the potential shape of global democracy sticks too far to the inner part of the nested diagram, which is on the handout uh, that you looked at, that we looked at earlier. There's a need, I think, on the other hand, to look at the broader the less structured domains of democratic and political representation. 
Thirdly, the willingness to step back and to model or to design more or less ideal institutions for transnational democratic representation is a familiar political theorist's impulse. In many political theorists' eyes, this is what you do. The first thing you do is step back from the material world, assume that there is an ideal model, and just try to be clever enough to discover and to describe and to advocate that model. This is an impulse that is worth resisting, I think. Slow theory, as I've tried to outline it very briefly, sees theoretical products again as co-productions, as taking more time, as being more attentive to context. So fourth, related to that, we need to do immersive theory, slow theory, immersive theory. Theory that pays close attention, detailed attention to a range of specific contexts, such as claims and their reception by different constituencies and audiences. I think we need also to keep an open mind about the extent of conceptual innovation that we need in order to understand democratic representation in this wider domain. Castiglione and Warren, for example, are worried that we need to emphasize new forms of accountability, as I suggested, where conventional electoral authorization is absent or relatively absent. Now that's fine. As far as it goes, I think that is fine. But my recommendation to look at the relatively unfamiliar notion of acceptance is, I would argue, a necessary innovation in these debates. Using acceptance rather than accountability allows more for the rapid and unpredictable changes in who may be invoked, whose identity may be presented, or indeed as a part of it, created as a part of representative claims. Whereas the idea of accountability, I think, implies a more persistent perhaps a more formal, certainly a more readily identifiable group of constituents. Now, of course, the performance, again, theatrically, the performance of representative claims may involve invoking a sense of authorization, a sense of accountability. And that is another interesting story. And finally here, I think it's better to emphasize practices over institutions and to trace potentially emergent institutions rather than putting forward this is democracy, end points. You know, a set of institutions and saying this is what global democracy is, must, will, is becoming to look like. As James Rosenau, a uh, key writer, as you'll know, uh, perhaps in many of these debates, uh, as Rosenau has made it clear, we do not know which of the emergent institutional configurations in transnational spaces survived till the end of the lecture almost. Yeah. Um, I once embarrassed myself by being um, the speaker whose phone went off. I mean, that's more unusual. Uh, which of the emergent institutional configurations in transnational spaces will crystallize, in a sense, will become widely accepted and become lasting forms of democratic practice. So, to come properly to a conclusion, one more minute, probably. One, okay. one more minute. So in summary, in a way, uh, an incomplete summary. Democratic theory's new global canvas, and there is a new global canvas out there to be painted on, and many are absolutely out there painting on it, has prompted global ambitions, I think, amongst democratic theorists and others. So focusing on representation, I've sketched, and again I emphasize that term, reasons to embrace slow theory, to be attentive, modest, interpretive, rather than forms of fast theory which reach for neater, timeless, and relatively fixed institutional responses, something like instant democracy of Sloterdijk. I've argued that we need to pause, we need to reflect on the messiness of transnational representation. I realize that my comments don't really scratch the surface, or they probably barely scratch the surface of a huge and complicated set of issues. Uh, what I hope I've been able to do at best is to provoke you a little and to provide some food for thought. And I will leave it there. Thanks.